be here, and I particularly uh, appreciated uh, what Pastor Chris just said. He, he looked at me and he said, he's been a pastor many, and he looked at my white hair, many years. <laughs> um, you didn't have to rub it in. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Maybe you have your iPhone or your pad. <clears throat> 2 Tim Timothy chapter 3. And tonight I'm going to read verse 1 through 5 and then skip down to verse 14 through 17. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Hear now the word of the living God. But understand this, that in the last days will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. But as for you, drop down to verse 14, but as for you, Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, correcting, excuse me, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so ends the reading of God's word, amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, on this joyful day, the occasion of the ordination of your servant, Clement Tendo, we ask you that your Holy Spirit may attend your word with power in our hearts to move us to trust, love, and obey you better in these last days until Christ returns. And we say, Amen. 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 Second Timothy is a prison letter. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. He goes on to say that he's actually in chains. This is, this is a hard prison. He is in chains. And he is living in a house. He's under house arrest in chains in Rome. Second Timothy 1. 16 and 17. It's more, though, than just a prison letter. It's a letter of a man who has been forsaken, an apostle who has been forsaken. Three times in this short letter, Paul mentions how his friends have deserted him. 2 Timothy 1.15, everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me. Again, 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me. And again, 2 Timothy 4, 16. At my first defense, no one, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. And yet, 2 Timothy is more than a prison letter or a letter of an apostle who has been deserted by all. 2 Timothy is Paul's death letter. Let me say that again. 2 Timothy is Paul's death letter. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, Paul says in verse 6 that he expects to depart this world. It's his imminent death. Expects to be probably executed. And he speaks of his life in the past tense. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now he looks ahead to the crown of glory. 
Do you see now why 2 Timothy is a very good passage on this occasion as we seek to <clears throat> install, uh, ordain Clement? 2 Timothy is written with an urgency and a solemnity of a dying man, a man dying for his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's who Paul is. Who's Timothy? Timothy's a young man, and he's Paul's understudy. As a young man, he was trained by Paul in pastoral ministry, and Paul eventually appointed him to serve as a pastor, one of the pastors in the church of Ephesus. So understandably, 2 Timothy is Paul's final counsel to this young pastor. Knowing all this, wouldn't you agree that this passage is most fitting for this day? So what counsel would you give Tim, uh, Clement? Right? What counsel would you give him today? What counsel does Paul give Timothy? Well, Paul's counsel to Timothy can be summed up in pretty, pretty simply. God's light for dark days is God's word. Continue in it. God's light for dark days is God's word. Continue in it. And I want to look at two things with you tonight, very briefly, that we're living in dark days and that God's light or lamp for such dark days is scripture alone. Let's take each of those in turn. Second Timothy 3 begins with a warning. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. <clears throat> Did you know that according to scripture, you're living in the last days? Just like Timothy was living in the last days. The last days in the New Testament refers to that age between Christ's first coming and his return, his second coming. All that time is the last days. And Paul is not counseling Timothy about dark days, in other words, that lie far ahead in some far distant future. He's talking about dark days now, today, in the present. And you might ask, what does he warn Timothy about? Well, he says in verse 1, there will come times of difficulty. He does not say all the time, but there will come times of difficulty. And indeed, doesn't the history of our church, Christ's church, bear this out? There have been periods of relative peace and relative persecution. There have been periods of an increase of godliness, truth, and reformation. And equally, there have been times of stagnation, falsehood, and decline. Like a ship on the ocean, life in Christ's church has not been all smooth sailing. She is often buffeted by storms, tempests, and squalls. Now the question for us is, what makes these days dark, difficult? Earthquake, tsunami, right? We could say hurricanes, a warning of hurricanes this fall. Wars, conflicts, dissensions, devils, demons, sickness or death. None of these, says Paul. No, the difficult times that Paul envisions, what he envisions is something far worse and more damning than any of these. And you may ask, what could be more worse than sickness and death? Well, having declared that times of difficulty will come, in verse 2, Paul gives us his reason. Verse 2, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, Unholy. Drop down to verse 4. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Saying, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. Did you hear that? What makes these times difficult 
is not sickness or death. It's what we always talk about. It's what we pray about. But Paul is more concerned with our souls. And it's more than just ungodly people. Look at verse 5 again. Listen to what he says. He says, they have the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Do you appreciate what Paul is actually talking about? He's not talking about people out there in the world, but people in here in the church. That's who Paul is speaking about. What we would call false believers. And isn't scripture replete with such warnings and times? Did not the prophets, such as Isaiah, condemn his own church in his day, calling Israel Sodom? Did not Christ accuse, saying, hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup, but inside are full of greed and self-indulgence? He said that to the ministers of his day. And don't we see this happening in the United States and all over the world? Story after story of pastors behaving badly, of sexual sins, sins of pride, arrogance, bully pastors, greedy pastors. And we even hear story after story of whole churches, entire denominations, casting off the true gospel and embracing ever more sordid falsehoods of this age. Paul says these sinners have an appearance of godliness, but they deny its power. What does that mean? Deny its power. It means simply that they proclaim faith in Christ, but there's no change in their life. There's a saying in America, we say, uh, they don't walk the talk. You may have heard that. They talk well, but they don't walk that way. As indicated early in verse 4, he says, such Christians are at heart really lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So that's the first part of Paul's counsel to young Timothy. Know the times. These are dark days. And Clement, I know you yourself have experienced early in life dark days, times of bloodshed, of treachery. Even your beloved father was kidnapped. Nevertheless, Paul warns here not of those difficulties, but of the difficulties within, within you and within the church. So be on your guard, be faithful, watch your life and your doctrine. These are dark days. And yet Paul doesn't stop there. He gives a second wonderful counsel. All right. Paul's counsel is more than this. He, he tells him not only to know the times, but to know God's word. When you live in dark days, you need nothing less than God's light and lamp. I don't know about down here, but in Philadelphia, I've never lived in a place where we have more blackouts. There's a little storm, and my house goes black and dark. Have you ever experienced that? Where no energy, no electricity, everything's dark, you can't see, and what's the first thing you do? You grab a flashlight, and then you turn it on, and you hold it out in front of you, and you walk very carefully. And this is exactly what Paul is counseling Timothy next. He turns to God's light for dark days, God's word. Verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. There it is. That's the counsel he gives. Two qualities about God's word I want to point out in particular. It's authority and usefulness. Clement, as you pastor, as you teach, as you preach, as you counsel God's word, for people in these last days, these dark days, 
one of the greatest temptations you're going to face is to doubt the very word of God that you preach and teach. You will be tempted to trust the words of man rather than the word of God. You'll be tempted to conform your own life to the world, to, to what other people are doing, rather than being transformed by the renewing of your mind and the hearing of the word of Christ. So Paul reminds Timothy that the final authority for life and godliness, not just for Clement, for all of us, is his word. Look at verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God, or God breathed. In other words, scripture is itself God's word. What scripture says, God says. What God says, scripture says. Now, it's not just some of scripture. That's all of it. It's every word of it is God's word. All 66 books, no more, no less. So the question for every Christian who's here, and especially for you tonight, Clement, is what's your first and final authority in your life? What guides, directs your life? Is it Holy Scripture? Does this word really govern your life? Did our own Lord Jesus, did he not, on the night he was betrayed, said, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Scripture is not only authoritative, it's the very word of God. It is useful. And Paul says this here, all scripture is God breathed, breathed out by God and profitable. Another translation, useful or beneficial. In other words, God's word does you good. Amen. Have you ever had that? Yeah, you read it and it's like, wow, that's a word I needed to hear. As a carpenter's given a hammer or a nurse a needle or a fisherman a net, God has given you, given us his word. And his word not to sit on a table somewhere or a shelf somewhere, but to use his word. Four things Paul points out. Scripture teaches us, rebukes us, corrects us, and trains us, trains us in righteousness. And I want to walk through those very briefly. First, Scripture teaches us. And that implies that we're ignorant. There's a lot we don't know about God and his ways. And Clement, how will they come? How will your people come to know and trust and love the Lord if you don't teach them. You need to teach them. Teach them the whole counsel of God, all the scripture. For the truths of scripture are more than just nice ideals, right? The moral truths, they're God's own revelation of himself and of his son, Jesus Christ, right? They're wise to make, able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, teach his word. Secondly, scripture is for reproof. It's easy to teach. I think reproof is hard. To reprove means to show somebody that they're at fault, that they've done something wrong, that they have sinned, and that they need to change. They need to repent. They need to turn back to the Lord. Christians wrestle with indwelling sin. And we all need reproof. I need reproof. My wife is great at giving me reproof, <laughs> right? And I need that. I really do. You need reproof. Clement, you need reproof. And the better you receive reproof, the better you'll know how to give reproof. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, nothing can be more cruel than the tenderness that consigns another to his sin. Nothing can be more compassionate than the severe rebuke that calls a brother back from the path of sin. It is a ministry of mercy. Thirdly, scripture is useful for correction, for teaching, reproof, and for correction. Clement, are you familiar with Come Thou Fount? Famous, right? Come Thou Fount of every blessing. There's a line in that where the pastor moans Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. He cries out. Do you see that in yourself? 
you'll also see it in others. We all stray. Sometimes we stray like a man who takes a wrong turn when he thinks he's still going the right way. But most of the time we stray very incrementally. Have you ever driven a car on the freeway? Maybe coming on 95. You know that open road where there's no other cars before you. And you're driving along and you're going at a good speed and sometimes when no one's looking, you'll just take your hands off the steering wheel. And you know what happens? Soon you begin to drift. Your car just begins to go a little bit to the right, or maybe for your car, a little bit to the left. And you realize you've got to grab the, the steering wheel again. When you're driving, you are making hundreds, thousands of minor corrections. And that's what Paul's talking about here, minor corrections. Clement, I want you to press in and ask godly men not only to pray and encourage you, but to correct you. Ask that of them. Good, wise men who can do that gently. Scripture is not only useful for teaching, reproving, correction, but training in righteousness. None of us, when we are born again, are born mature. We have to grow up. And this is what he's getting at here. Scripture is meant to train you, to get you better skilled, understand better the ways of God. So one question that a good diagnostic, is Scripture training me? Can you say this week, Scripture as I was reading scripture or studying scripture or hearing a sermon, I learned something, right? I was taught in it. I was trained. Or scripture corrected me, convicted me of my sin, showed me where I need to repent. Scripture trained me. It showed me how to use my words to heal rather than to hurt my loved ones around me, how to better love my my spouse, my friend, to encourage and train my children, how to better use my money, how to witness better at work in word and deed, how to love my neighbor, and above all, is scripture training you to love, trust, obey, and cherish your God more, right? Do you use scripture as God intends? I don't think there's a better example of this than Matthew 4, that famous scene where Jesus is being tempted in the desert. Satan himself tempts Jesus. And what does Jesus do to defend himself against great Satan? Does he perform a miracle? Does he call legions of angels to help? Does he cry out, Father, give me new revelation. I need new revelation. None of these. What does he do? He relies on nothing less than scripture that he has read, likely memorized, and meditated upon. Satan urges him, turn these stones to bread. And Jesus replies, it is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Three times Jesus says that. It is written. It is written. It is written. And each time it follows by a scripture, by a specific scripture. He doesn't sound like a theologian to me, right? Go up to Westminster. That, that, that's not how we talk. What does that sound like to you? It is written, and he recites a scripture. It sounds like a kid coming out of Awana. It sounds like a kid coming from Sunday school. Did you learn the scripture? And he did. This is our Lord. That's how you fight against temptation. That's how you defeat the devil. Clement, you're embarking on a call as a pastor. And you're 
call, the call God has called you with has been confirmed by your church, your presbytery, and it's a calling on how to live and lead Christ's church in these dark days through the use of God's light. God's counsel to you is the same as to Timothy. Continue in what you have learned and become convinced of the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Be a faithful man of God. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day that we are a people that you have brought together and you have given us your word for these dark days. I pray for One Voice Fellowship in particular. May your word in their hearts and mouths be a great light and lighthouse for this dark area. In Christ's name we pray, amen.